Uh, first off, congratulations on the film. Thank you. It's, it's wonderful. And as a guy who grew up, I was 17 in 1999. Oh, man. Uh, I didn't do drugs, mum, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> like these guys do. But it was such a great kind of flashback for me to, to, my, to my youth. So I just wanted, first question, how long have you been sitting on this idea and what, what was the, the catalyst for you to finally go, I'm going to try and make this now? Yeah, I mean, truth is, I've not been sitting on this idea for very long at all. Okay. I was in development for a very different idea and then there was a new head of film at the BBC and she was like, what else you got? And literally a week before, the idea of telling this story had popped into my head and um, I pitched it to my producers. They were like, actually, that's, that's not bad. And then we pitched it to the BBC and they were like, yes. And then commissioned to script, write the script and the rest is history. So it happened quite quickly, but I'd been in development for literally years on another film that may never ever get made or get seen. Um, but the world has been something that's been in my head for a long time. Yeah. You know, this version of London is something I know intimately and love and have always wanted to see on the big screen. And it was like the perfect opportunity to throw that in as a backdrop to the story that we wanted to tell. Yeah, because you're from North London or South London? I'm from around here. You're so from, I'm, I'm these from parts yeah, where yeah, we are. I'm, I'm from Holloway. Um, and I was born in Tottenham Court Road and grew up in Finsbury Park, Holloway. Um, like Islington and Hackney really was like my stomping grounds as a kid, but then when I was 14, I moved to South. So I've lived both sides of the river. So I'm, I'm North London, and I'm usually, as we talked about off camera, I'm usually only had to spend about an hour in, yeah. these, in these parts. 90 minutes. Because of Arsenal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's usually not a fun experience, but never mind, <laughs> it's all good. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's wonderful to see that park, because I'm from North London, I'm from Enfield, so it was nice to see even these parts of London. In terms of filming around here, because you make it so cinematic, and sometimes you see these places and you go, could these places be on film? But actually, <laughs> you've managed to do that. Was it an easy thing to do? Because your director of photography must have done an amazing job for you, you must have been yeah, delighted with what you saw. It's very kind, thank you. Um, there were moments where when I was writing the script I was like where are we gonna actually put this scene and um, not to take anything away from the director of photography because she's incredible Rachel I love you to bits but um, this is my manner and there are places that I knew that I wanted to put certain scenes so you know if you're if you know we're green you know the Harry Gay ladder you know how unique and weird those long alleyways are I was yeah, like yeah. right we're doing a scene here Hence the boys walking through that alleyway to go and meet Mega Man, you know? And then uh, Seven Sisters Road, the Tottenham Snow. I've driven past that landmark my entire life in the back of my, you know, my stepdad's car through to having my own car. And it's sort of like, oh, I'm nearly home. It was like, when you see the snail, you know you're nearly home. That was always the thing in my head. Um, and I've always thought, how amazing would it be to put that on the big screen? So the amount of messages I got when the trailer dropped with the shot of the boy sat in front of the Seven yeah. Sisters now, it was like, yeah, man, that's, that's the Eiffel Tower in North London, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 it, is, it totally is. You're mm. absolutely right. And also, I mean, when you make a period piece, it's tricky anyway, but obviously the 90s, it was, there was so much going on that was so definitive. Like, you know, you talk about the Backstreet Boys, you talk about the phones, you've even got the great Ericsson phone poster in the, in yeah. the bus stop. How difficult was it to, to get all those things right? Because I know some people who watch the film or any film with periods will just go, that's not right, that's not right. Yeah. But everything, you seem to have you know, dyed well, every eye and crossed every T with it. Yeah, I mean, incredible production designer. Uh, Francesca's amazing. Fran just smashed it to pieces with the detail. But also there was a lot of detail in the script because again, these are my formative years. This is the era that I love. So I'm quite a specific person anyway. I like what I like. And when it comes to uh, my writing, uh, I feel that uh, detail can tell you a lot about a character. So I would always put in what a character's wearing, what their bedroom looked like, and be very specific on those things. And then even in meetings with you know, production design, there are little details in there that I felt so vindicated on putting in on premiere night because all my sisters were there. My big sister came up to me and she went, I can't believe you put your bedspread in there. <laughs> and like in Two Tons' bedroom, he's got my Thundercats bedspread that I oh, had no way. when I was a kid. <laughs> and I literally sent them a picture and I said, this is the bedspread for Two Tons' bedroom. And they went on eBay and found it. And it was like, oh my God. And you know, all the detail that like the signed Dennis Burkamp posters, there's pictures of Charlie Brown MC on the wall, like all of these things that were super small, only if you look for them will you see them. Um, I really wanted in there. And there were pictures of my bedroom that I gave the guys and they recreated it for Two Tons Bedroom. Nice, Tamagotchi as well. Tamagotchi, Flat Eric, it's all in there. I ain't seen one of them for ages. And that ringtone, you can't, that Nokia yeah, yeah. ringtone, it's cool so definitive. It. Yeah, 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 it's so weird. I was actually gonna ask you about phones because I remember having a, uh, did you have a favorite kind of phone, Nokia phone when you were growing up? Um, I, I think I had 3210 because he's playing Snake. And, yeah. 
It's just we, so reminiscent of, of yeah, teenage years. Where we were growing up, we called it the face off because you could take literally take the face off. Oh yeah, of course. And you change faces. it, yeah. And yeah. You, you could get like really snazzy, expensive ones from Carphone Warehouse, but you could also buy cheap ones from Chapel Market. So it was like the best phone in the world. So um, yeah, I, I had a face. That was my first phone. A Nokia face off, that's what I called it anyway. I think you do that with the back of your phone, I don't you get the cheap ones off the, yeah. off the market and the exactly. nice ones. Exactly, like clear batteries and stuff, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to ask you about the three, the three guys mm. because when you're telling the story about friendship, obviously you want, the audience wants to buy into the fact that they are friends and these guys are so in that zone in terms of being friends. Mm. How difficult was it to, to find them? And when you did find them, it must have made your job so much easier that they not only helped you, but yeah. together they're such a great trifecta. Amazing casting director in Shaheen Baig, uh, she put brilliant talent in front of me and um, the minute I saw all three of these boys I knew that they were the roles and then when we got to the chemistry test and gave them a chance to sort of play together it was just instant, you just knew and that's not taking anything away from any of the other young actors that came through for the film, they were amazing but these three together was just magic and it's only got stronger and stronger as time's gone on. In a weird way, I, I wish I could film them now because they are super tight friends and this experience has helped that in a lot of ways. Yeah, and obviously you, I know you shot during the pandemic and I had, to, mm. had to shut down. I can imagine that's difficult for any filmmaker, but for someone when you're <laughs> dealing with a budget like you are and dealing with what you're dealing with, how difficult was it that, that period? It must have been frustrating, but also strange in the sense that there was obviously a lot of other stuff going on beyond your control. Mate, I tell you the weirdest thing about it is that I have nothing to compare it to, mm. so I don't know. Like, I've only ever as a filmmaker made a film for next to no money with a global pandemic. So whatever I do next <laughs> be will be infinitely easier. <laughs> I mean, I know they're different, uh, so I've got nothing to compare it to. Um, when you are directing and producing and writing, so much of it is on your hands, so much of it is on your shoulders, should I say, um, that you just want everybody to have a good time you want it to go well. And they were the things that were constantly playing on my mind. But um, as I said, I, I've not got any other version to put this up against. So f ask me film two. Film two, we'll ask you on film <laughs> ask two. Ask me after film two, yeah. yeah. And obviously you've made, I know you've been involved with documentaries on BBC, you've done some short films. How helpful were they in terms of you and your first, uh, doing your directorial debut? Because I can imagine it's a gargantuan thing anyway, but they, they, did they help you in some way? Did they help kind of prepare you for what might be occurring regardless of obviously the pandemic? Documentaries have been incredibly helpful, man. Mm. I mean, um, I learned so much about storytelling from documentaries because, you know, you're walking into an environment where you don't know what you're going to get. And then when you get in the edit room, you have to craft it. You know, you have to find a way to get your sequences in order and, you know, deliver an arc in terms of somebody's journey across 60 minutes. That was so beneficial when it came to crafting uh, feature film ideas. And as someone who's written for so many years and just not had the balls to show anyone, I was learning through documentaries, literally on the evening after shooting a doc, I'd be in my hotel room on final draft, like, oh, maybe we should change this around and working on stuff. And it's just taught me so much about storytelling. And when you're storytelling in the real world, it's infinitely more difficult than creating the story from scratch, yeah. which is what I've essentially had to had the opportunity to do with this. Yeah. In terms of your influences, I know uh, you mentioned Eddie Murphy in, in the in the film, which is I love Eddie Murphy. He's, he's amazing. But in terms of you kind of growing up and wanting to get into filmmaking, was there any filmmakers or any people that you kind of look up to made you wanting to get into doing this? I mean, everyone has loads, obviously. But yeah, I could talk all day about the, the filmmakers and the films that have influenced me. But I'm a child of the '80s, man. Yeah, so I, I just grew up watching. Uh, watching all of those 80s, everything from screwball co comedies like Airplane right the way through to, you know, the classics, uh, everything from the John Candy, the children, the children of SNL that had all of those movies that defined an era for the 80s and the 90s. I mean, they were all incredibly huge for me, but also the, the films of uh, John Singleton and, and people like Spike Lee, and these have all played a, a massive influence on my work. And I mean, we can go into Kurosawa and Godard and all of that stuff, but that's all there but they're really the headlines because they felt like worlds that I wanted to operate within, you know? Films that felt current and that felt like my world, like, you know, the Brooklyn that Spike Lee delivers is infinitely different to the New York that Scorsese presents. And I found those incredibly influential in a lot of ways. And yeah, we can talk about Lehen and Kasovitz and all these different people, but who I am as a filmmaker, I think is all of those uh, directors and writers and auteurs combined through the filter of a kid growing up in London in a lot of ways. Yeah, and you managed to get that ghastly, horrible 90s Arsenal kit in there, I have to say. 
<laughs> the bruised banana is a legendary <laughs> shirt that needed its place in cinematic history and it now has it. Thank now you very much. Now has it, the, the Ian Wright kit. Yeah. As a Spurs fan, that's this, yeah. <laughs> Good, good, I guess. Well, I mean, high for, not high fidelity. What is that movie that uh, the one about about Fever Arsenal? Pitch. Fever Pitch, yeah. exactly. There's a lot of Arsenal shirts in that, but the bruised banana just didn't get the love it deserves. And seeing yeah. a young 18-year-old Gary Jones see wearing that shirt is just perfect <laughs> in a lot of ways. There's not many movies about Spurs. I don't know. Maybe they're dramatic enough. Weird that. Weird, isn't it? That's weird. No Spurs movies. How strange. Never mind. Uh, so lovely to talk to you. Thanks so much for you your time. Too, Absolute man. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, awesome. guys. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching. Hey, you guys! Hey, you guys, huh? Hey, you guys, Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey, you guys!